E allora... Che dici? Iniziamo? Iniziamo, ok. I thank you very much uh, Davide Ruzzon, who is here with us. Uh, just a brief presentation. Iniziamo. He is an architect, an Italian architect. Iniziamo. Who okay. graduated thank from very much, uh, University of Venice, Ruzzon, where in uh, 2017 uh, found a massive creation at, uh, that is neuroscience architect, architectural design. He's also a member of the European Healthcare Conference Program Committee held annually in London. That is the neuroscience. Sarah Robinson and Alessandro Bezzara is co-editor of the architectural magazine Interwining, published by Mimesis International. In London. And together with uh, Vittorio Gallese and Rod Tuned Architecture in 2016, an essay about the concept of embodiment in architecture. In 2013, published the architecture of the difference and promoted in Venice a conference around the question of perception. The book written by Stephen Hall, Ioanni Palas, and Alberto Perez Gomez in 1993. He is also the author of various collection of essays about the relationships between architecture and philosophy and neuroscience and architecture. In 2010, he became part of the editorial staff of Anfione Zeto magazine, and in 2011, he had a collaboration with the Polytechnico University of Milan at the element for critics the contemporary architecture. He began also his professional activity in, in 1994 and in 2000 established the yeah, office, a multidisciplinary firm settled in Eugane Hills, close to Venice. Since uh, 2016, he interlaced Lombardini 22, a Milan based design company with the aim to develop Tuner, a new project devoted to linking neuroscience and architecture. In 2022, he published the last book, Tuning Architecture with Humans, Mimesis International, and since April 2023, he is an Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture Advisory Council member. So, thank you very much. And Yes. Grazie. Uh, love to everybody. Thanks. An Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture Advisory Council. Wow. It's okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, thanks a lot, Paola, for the kind invitation, and thanks uh, to all of you to be here this afternoon. Totally. Um, I would like to to thank also. Eh, Torino, il Salone del Libro, perché è impossibile per me avoiding making reference to the, the simultaneous uh, going. I would like to, to start now. <clears throat> well, um, the reason for which I mentioned it will be clearer, I hope. Um, so, the first thing I want to say is the jump that you're well, seeing the cover uh, is a for which I mentioned something that would be explained through the discourse I'm starting now. Trenching. So the first thing I want to say one day in a catcher tree noticed that humans climbing its branches all share the same facial expressions <clears throat> as they ascended. For a long time the tree wondered why the creatures Hence, in a catch, and then at the top, 
that humans climbing mind broadly. All share the same that passion. That having the same as they share it. The creatures share the time, and, and the joy of their the creatures. So their expressions and then were identical when they finished. The following day, astonishingly, the tree discovered that the humans didn't perceive their feelings. So their expressions were used to climb it, but were almost unaware of the presence of others. Astonishingly, the tree discovered the idea catch made us didn't perceive. It will teach humans how to recognize their own sensations by looking more carefully at similar faces in others of their species. So, humans started climbing the tree more slowly, posing and looking at their companions' faces while they move upward. So, Humans. After a few days, the tree was going to abandon its Nothing was changing. But then one day, all of a sudden, human recognized herself in the body of a companion. Her actions were mirrored in the fashion expression or the, of her fellow climber. She wasn't alone in her feelings of life. in the body of a companion. Her actions were mirrored. The tree was so happy it decided to talk about this with the ground, her hill, and the water. She wasn't alone. It turned out that these other natural elements had perceived the same kinds of faces, expressions, and voices, but in their different mixtures. So. In the water. They organized a meeting plan how to extend the first lesson the same to all natural senses, expressions, and voices. But once the plan has, was hatched, the humans started to perceive their bodily response to walking natural senses on the ground, laying down the plan as right, hatched. Sitting a while to rest, climbing up the hill, and diving into fresh water to cool off. They began to see themselves as social creatures by noticing the movements of others and diving into fresh water to cool off. They began to see themselves. As social creatures, sitting a while by not seeing the movements, I've been always, um, I've been always uh, captured by the question Lucan was was uh, claiming at that time, particularly at the end of his life, <clears throat> about the the, been always, um, the architecture always, uh, for the human institution, which is uh, the, by the question kind Lucan of uh, was form was a claiming at that time that we have to look at the end of his life. Other, in other terms, namely, why assembly rooms have the shape of an assembly room? Or why schools form have the shape of a school that we have to look at the end of his life? In other terms, namely, why assembly rooms have the shape of an assembly room? Why schools? Because they are the shape of functional programs. Yes, but not only. Why assembly rooms? The, shape the reason is that buildings are memories of uh, expectations. Why schools? Because Expe they are human programs. Yes. Eros <clears throat> is the son of Penia and Poros. The reason is that Penia buildings is cool. are memories of. Uh, and is the desire. Poros is rich and it expedient. So Eros is a, affected by a sense of lack. 
and is the desire. And Eros, uh, Eros is rich. His concept uh, is and an issue that uh, coupled profoundly with the so hope, is, uh, the principle of hope around which Ernst Bloch uh, walked uh, all his life, writing the very famous book, uh, The Principle of Hope. But we have to understand that uh, Eros, the hope, is also another way to speak about the system of seeking. The system of seeking is one of the basic emotions that Jak Panksepp, a neurobiologist recently passed, has been studied for all his life. <clears throat> because of the basic emotions are seven sisters led by the system of seeking. Seeking is, uh, in other terms, something that always we trigger each day. Humans, uh, namely, never start an experience without expectation. We never start an, an experience during the day without an expectation. Expectation are emotions? Yes and no. Because expectations are not only basic emotion as a seeking, I was saying, uh, play to play or to take care, the lust, the hunger, the panic, the fear, the, the seven basic emotion that as human we share with mammals. Hmm? There's a very basic underground, we have the mammalian brain is a, a deep brain that inside which we have refined along evolution, the same systems of emotions that we share with mammals. Expectation are not only basic emotion, but for architects is more important than the basic systems. Also bodily sensation or as Damasio is used to name them, a background emotions, bodily sensation, sensation, as a, a sensation of warm, of freshness, the sense of balance, the sense of activation, of relaxation, and so on. Different bodily sensation. And so basic emotions, uh, anger, play, care, in some way are nested into sensation, into bodily sensation, background bodily emotion, bodily sensation. Act for example, the care is embedded in the relaxation, the sense of care to take care of is uh, embedded in the sense of relaxation or to play, this is a basic emotion, fundamental basic emotion to play can be, as embedded into the activation, the sensation to activate, to arouse. And now we come back to the Akacha tree. <clears throat> Our friend, very good friend for us. <clears throat> we come back to the Akacha tree because uh, um, exactly Falk and Balling uh, published this paper in 13 years ago, but they, this is a, a, the, the final turn of the final result of a, a long work they developed uh, analyzing how the people in different cultures, in different geographical regions were able to respond, re were responding to the landscapes, the different landscapes in the world. They discovered the, there was an innate preference for the Akacha tree, for the savanna landscape. And this kind of a, a analysis being named the, the savanna-like uh, hypothesis because they discovered that in different cultures, presenting different landscapes, different woods, the people, may, particularly when they are early, they, they, when they are youth, prefer strongly the savanna 
landscape. The savanna landscape is this is the landscape uh, that humans inside which the sapiens developed uh, in the northeast area of Africa. This is the, the area from which everybody came, <clears throat> because everybody of us came from the north east of Africa, starting from 80, 180,000 years ago. <clears throat> So they discover the innate preference for this kind of landscape. And this landscape is preferred because the Akacha is the key, is the, 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 the player, is the player of this landscape, is the pivot of this landscape. And the reason is really clear because Akacha is a very good affordance, is a mechanism that promotes the interaction, promotes bodily interaction as to humans to interact more directly and strongly is an affordance as we, we are going to, to see better. This kind of affordance is a system, is an architectural, natural architectural, it is a, certain, a sort of oxymoron, natural architectural mechanism that is able to trigger a, 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 a kinematic interaction with humans. Because then there are the, the many other landscapes Falke Balling was showing, the tree, the Akacha tree is before very, very, very low. Think about all the, the, the kind of uh, trees you can figure out in di different landscapes. This is one of the, the, the easier uh, trigger to jump, to, to, be, to be climbed by humans because it, it, it before at very low level when the people can jump and start climbing on it. It is the reason, one of the reasons for which the humans, the sapiens survived in the, in the, in the very challenging, unconditioned uh, along the evolution. So if you consider this kind of experience to be able to survive, you can recognize how the marker hypothesis is, uh, is working. What does this kind of hypothesis claim? It claims that when we create uh, an emotion, when we perceive an emotion in, our, in, in front of us, emotion that can be tri triggered uh, in, internally, as we were saying, because when we project outward as an expectation, we project outward in, a, in a, an expectation form of emotions. But we can produce the same kind of experience also meeting an event, facing event outside, as probably during the, that period our ancestor was living. Because if you, fi if you find a Leon in front of you, probably you perceive some emotions and you are able to escape, you jump, climb, and feel the relief, the sense of relief. This, the, the sequence of different kind of emotions is a, a system, is a marker, somatic marker, because this kind of experience marks profoundly our body, transform our body, the tension of the muscle, the breath, the earth beat, all this physiological system is being transformed by the experience. And we create a cipher, a signature, a physiological signature. And this kind of experience is something that transforming our body can be depicted and represented in the mind and creating an, a neuro, neuro circuitry capable, a path, a neuro circuitry, a neuronal path inside which we store this kind of experience. And it is a, a mark that can be more, more, and more easily remembered. <clears throat> it's the valence and the salience of the experience inside the space create a steady memory. Really important factor: this steady memory, something that we can remind, remind not because we need to recover it cognitively using our willness, but implicitly without the effort to recover it. Antonio Damasio uh, pr proposed this kind of reading about the emotion effectiveness respect to the bodily dimension. And 
we can add that the tree is the one affordance that immediately recovered the memory of this experience. And this is the reason for which people, considering the long distance in, term, in temporal terms from the moment in which they, they, the ancestors developed this kind of relationship with the, the Akacha trees, the, the Akacha trees has been able to recover also in our time this kind of uh, sensation, the memory. So the Kachatu is an affordance, is an architectural natural element. <clears throat> and the jump, uh, the jump is something that we remember in a very clear way. This is, the jump is, a, is not occasionally in the cover of the book. So emotions and sensations are bodily kinematics memory bodily kinematics memory, emotion and sensation are bodily kinematic memories sculpted into our body, our flesh and mapped in our neuro circuitries. And Maxine she Johnson writing down this very crucial, this is a cornerstone of our understanding, the primacy of movement has been able to depict the role that the, the movement of the body have been able to produce um, the outcome, the movements have been able to produce in the evolutionary dimension. Also with Rodolfo Linas, a neuroscientist, a neurobiologist, a Colombian, Colombian that has been working at the New York University till a few years ago. <clears throat> uh, he written Eye of the Vortex, uh, describing how, the, how, how important is the movement of the body for our evo evolution and for our for the space, as we are going to see, the space that wrap the movement. Because uh, the physiologies, the signatures of the physiologies that we produce uh, modifying our body during the interaction with the acacia trees, but not only, for example, this kind of sensation, emotions, has been translated to the environment, producing the physiologies. There's no divide. There's a, a continuity between the sensation that we record and memorized, and the space the features of the space that has been able to trigger this different kind of physiologies. The background bodily emotion are loaded into more complex interactive patterns of body within the environment. Loaded into interactive, interactive patterns of the body within within the environment, not with, within the environment. And the humans evolved the refining some crucial, crucial patterns of interaction. And the, a moment really important for our understanding, for the comprehension of this process has been the erectus phase. Because the, the erectus phase starting two, two million years ago, it's been crucial because uh, this new condition permitted humans to mirror themselves, to mirror themselves in the facial expression of others, human beings. It is the, the story that the, the, the very short novel I mentioned at the beginning it is the key. When we started recognizing ourselves, when we started recognizing ourselves in the eyes, in the facial expression, the bodily outcomes <clears throat> of other humans, along with interaction inside the world, inside the nature first, the nature first, but the nature is the first architecture that we met. I anticipated a, a point, a key point, because I think that we have to, uh, to move the, <clears throat> the clock of uh, the beginning of a history of architecture well before. 
the the the, the beginning that the, that we are used to think. Um, so sharing emotions and mirroring themselves in the bodies of others, humans came to birth to the birth of consciousness. The birth of consciousness is related to the perception of our self in the mirror of the others. We cannot detach. The, we cannot think about the consciousness as a gift by God, by this sudden period. Okay, uh, I found I found the consciousness here. I have the consciousness in my, my pocket. Uh, oh, this is my, con no, the consciousness cannot, can work in this way. The consciousness slowly, very, very slowly grew up, grew up through the facial, the interaction, the intersubjective relationship between humans. And the body has been the key. And the erectus dimension is one of the impo more important issues. Mirroring themselves in the bodies of others and chest started to recognize their sensation. You see, this is the... One day, the Akacha tree succeeded. This is the result. Akacha tree succeeded exactly for this reason. But also the water. Because the water woke up the sensation of freshness. And the peak of the hill brought the sensation of activation of at the mind, the sense of, of activation. Because walking up till the peak of a hill, you activate gradually in completely different signal to your body. The activation is completely different. And the rock has been able to recreate the condition through which your body was able to rest, to take a pose, creating a trajectory and perfect signature of, and the grass really, raise up the sensation to relax because you to, on the ground, when you lay down your body on the ground, you change completely the signature, physiological signature. You transform your heart and breathing rhythms, creating completely different physiological condition. At the end, <clears throat> to thank nature, humans give the air back their sensation and um, or the same feelings that natural setting had been able to elicit. They give back to the natural the sensation. So ascending a peak or descending a slope, or diving into the water, embracing a, a person, laying down on the ground, resting on a seat, uh, jumping on a tree, all these special configuration, these special configurations, acquire specific bodily sensation or emotions produced by bodies in action within them. But not least because Laying down, we can take an example. Laying down on the ground. From dynamic uh, physiologies, within special features, from this came poetic contents. But poetic uh, contents are nothing but the main engine of metaphors. So here we can find and recognize a profound connection between the biology and the cultural dimension. Vittorio Gallese and George Lakoff uh, written this paper almost 20 years ago, explaining how the same brain mechanism that regulated the actions the same brain mechanism that regulated the movement of the body laying down or the movement of the body kicking a chair if you are hunger, the same brain mechanism is the same mechanism capable to trigger concept, rational, abstract thinking. George Rakoff is a is a, one of the most important uh, linguistic in the world. Vittorio Gallese is a, with uh, Giacomo Rizzolati, one of the men discovered the mirror neurons in Parma at the early 90s, last century. 
In this paper is fundamental, you find a way to understand how the bodily mechanism, body gesture, the kinematic of the body. So you can understand how we are used to say, I want to dive in a new adventure. This is a saying uh, very popular, universally <laughs> distributed, I think. I want to dive in a new adventure. So the freshness, the sensation of freshness merge with the beginning, the concept of beginning. Because when we want, when we say, I want to dive in this, this new adventure, we are shorting, we are making a, we are shortening in some way, mm, the phrase according to which I would say, I could also say, I would like to start this kind of new adventure because I want to be, to grasp a new beginning. You shorten this kind of a, a claim. Say, I want to die. You use a, you use a, a kinematic uh, mechanism, a bodily kinematic mechanism to say this. And so the freshness, the sensation of freshness merged with the concept of beginning. And so from the physiology, we move to the concept domain. From the domain of the physiology, you move to the domain of the, this is a clear metaphor. When you say, I want to hug a belief, you, the worm, the sensation of worm that is proper, is a pro, the appropriate, uh, is belong to the, to the hug, merge with the belonging, I want to belong. I want to belong. To belong is a concept that the sensation embedded in the mechanism, in the kinematic mechanism, can express perfectly. I want to, I'm used to say, I want to make a jump of quality. Why we are using a jump of quality? Because the sense of lightness merged with improvement. Lightness and improvement, moving up. Spatial dimension. So slowly, along evolution, layerings of habits, mites, ritual, increase the, into the mind. Because starting from the, the Homo erectus phase, gradually the mind evolution started the layering, creating a, a very big amount of relationship, rituals, mites, habits in, in the groups. The, this, elements increased a lot. But the hunters and gatherers, because uh, till that moment, before the Neolithic revolution, before the people decide to stop the ne so-called Neolithic revolution, the hunters and the gatherers never had the chance to stabilize their settlements. And this is the, the phase in which we we can connect this process with the theoretical phase of mind evolution proposed by Merlin Donald, a neuroanthropologist, a Canadian neuroanthropologist. Proposed, according to his studies, that memories and ritual is being transferred, externalized in artificial setting. So at certain point, humans decide to externalize the expectations and the rituals they were being used to develop inside the nature in steady, regulated, available, easier, artificial setting. And they built Gobekli Tepe. This is the, the, the picture of Gobekli Tepe. You, you should start looking for this. First, the uh, architecture has been built uh, 12 thousand years before Christ, 6,000 years before Stone Age, before the pyramids. These transfers, the transfers of our minds, rituals in stone, produces the metaphorical affordance. Metaphorical affordance is something different than the tree that we were seeing before. It's not an object, it's not a chair. The chair is an affordance because the chair through its form, shape, give us the implicit 
mechanism to use it, suggest the ways through which our body interacts with the object. Making this transfer in that period, we produce something similar, but in metaphorical affordances because we transferred the concept and the sensation embedded in the interaction patterns in architectural in an architectural object. Because the affordance is being expanded, extended into the room, well beyond the single object, evoking bodily kinematics. So this turn shows how from Gibsonian, the chair, humans built metaphorical affordances, namely architectures, grounding dynamical perception, because what we have to take in mind, one of the home take that we have to, to fix now is that architecture is never perceived in one glance, never. <clears throat> we live inside, we experience architecture. This is a key. This is a key. We never, we are used to think about architecture because we too frequently hit architecture through magazines, web magazines and magazines, pictures, pictures and pictures. Architecture is not a pictures. It's not a bi-dimensional object. It is something that we experience in dynamic dimension because we are not trees with roots on the ground. We are, we have legs, we have bodies. We are, we are bodies mainly moving inside space, experiencing architecture through our sensorial system, multi-sensorial system. <clears throat> so the tree embeds the jump. And the jump can be analyzed, can be analyzed using as a filter all the sensorial system. Sensorial system is really rich, more and more than visual. There's a proprioceptive dimension, an interoceptive dimension. There's the inner ear inside here that control and record all the movement of our body. There's the muscle, the skeletal system. There's the, the retina and the eyes capable to analyze the, 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 the lights in very different ways. The touch, the skin, the function, the hearing, the visual system, the chemical milieu, the breathing and the air bait. And so we can start uh, using all these channels uh, as reference to analyze the body movement and the emotion connected. We can start uh, drawing out, drawing out from this kind of lecture of the body movement, uh, the signal capable to regulate uh, the indoor design of of building, in a way capable to attune the perception of people with the emotion that we are expecting. So within architectures, the synchronization of rhythm, rhythmic interaction into their space among humans through perception refine collective habits. This is another important issue, the rhythm, rhythms, rhythms that we produce interacting inside the world uh, is better regulated through our artificial settings because the measures, the rhythm that we can create designing can permit to humans to refine the social interaction. We can, we can believe that we are one than many. Architecture has been always used to produce this kind of uh, outcome. I want that you believe that you are one, not many, one body the social body, the social body. <clears throat> and the rhythm of architecture is, a, is being conceived to create this kind of condition. It is a, so the externalization means that the perception start inside as expected emotion. This is one of the most important take home that I want to say. Externalization means that the perception, our perception of architecture start inside, inside our brain as a projection of patterns of interaction. And the attunement is a coupling between an inner projection and the sensory environmental perception. There's a twofold process. 
one we one time on time in the same time we project outward something that we expect to perceive the erotic dimension about which i was mentioning before we are expecting something we project a desire in form of architecture and the sensory systems of our body detect what we are perceiving in dynamic dimension trying to couple the two the two processes and this kind of uh, uh, mechanism is being called by Andy Clark a predictive process. We predict uh, how we want to interact within the world, and we try to understand if what we perceive the, through the detection, through the vision, through the muscle skeletal system moving inside the space, the skins, the warmth, the freshness into play, the touch, all the sensorial system, the smell, the hearing, Oh, you you perceive also through the hearing, here's what you what is the, the dimension of the space around you. All this data is a, some models. And epoche or the phenomenological take of the experience can support architects because essences, bodily sensation, and metaphors are merged into bodily kinematics. So we can recognize some kind of note uh, of a uh, neurophenomenological note uh, of experiences. So the learning is a note of many different trees uh, and all these trees are intertwined. There's a not an overlapping and heading, uh, but the profound intertwining between the physiological and the cultural dimension. But the sensation also being transferred to cultural patterns, the jump sense of lightness, the lightness. So the symbolic object representing the lightness on the pictorial representation or the mythological or philosophical representation of lightness that we can find in the cultural expression or also in the sport expression, literature, Calvino, Il Barone Rampante. Architecture is an externalization and petrification of habits of emotion, of many different kinds of emotions. The different kind of kinematics and the different kind of architectural natural system affordance well uh, can, is able, are able to welcome and to host a different sensation. And the architecture born as a composition of diverse emotional rituals belonging to the group of, of ancestors. And this sensation raises at the mind becoming phenomenological essences of human experiences. This kind of sensation has been transformed as a concept. The line, the lightness became beginning. A beginning is a something that belongs to particular places in our life. And we look for this kind of places in our life. But all that is not enough. As the master Manfredo Tafuri would have said, we are only at the beginning. Because in our age, we are facing a completely different condition. <clears throat> The neutral, the neutral is a, is the king today. <clears throat> the neutral, and more than neutral, there's a, a kind of uh, objectification. Architecture is an object, mainly today. The modern and the contemporary design frequently have brought to the pure co conceptualization of architecture. As uh, my grave would say, architecture today is uh, too frequently, not always fortunately, but too frequently an object. It's conceived as an object. But the question now, for now is, uh, when did it begin? Because we are used to think that this happened recently. Um, so the, the, the Walter Benjamin uh, loss of aura starts with an industrial serial production Probably you know what Walter Benjamin, the concept of loss aura. The, 
we are used to think that this kind of process started with the industrial production, the serial industrial production. But we have to ask ourselves uh, an another question. Can we think that this kind of uh, transformation has been triggered also by the purely conceptual representation? Maybe yes, because I think that conceptual reduction, the conceptual reduction of the built space started well before the Industrial Revolution. Representation of ideas or abstract concepts are ways to utilize the power of emotion and metaphor. The power of emotion and metaphor is something that is um, as a very great, great fascination, as always, dress the great fascina fascination to the power, using the emotions and using the, the bodily emotion, the basic emotion, but also the, the, the background bodily emotions. Representation of ideas not connected with human habits, with the habits of humans, or with a neurophenomenological essence of a specific experience is an abstraction. It produces objects, but not architectural. In this frame, emotions are used to prompt a singular personal belief or to enhance the grip of power on the collective imagery. And so the loss of aura is a, is a lack of attunement because there's a divide between the experience humans seek and the sensation that through the environment, through the architecture, they can find. So you, you frequently find something that is not aligned. That the space that you are experiencing is, not, is completely devoted, is completely uh, void of any connection between what we expect and what we find outdoor. <clears throat> For example, the sense of whole is being used to glorify the power or the sensation of harmony or balance has been misused to unify in spaces among buildings, moving from the Athen Acropolis to the grid, the Mileto grid. This kind of shift, really ancient shift, is another representation of a of a challenge, of a fight between two different ways to conceive geometry at the beginning of the history of architecture between Pythagoras and Heraclito. Pythagoras, the unified geometry, and Heraclito, the father of the dynamic uh, geometry. From the Alexander the Great, the Hellenism definitely embraced the Pythagorean approach to space. And so the voice has been unified in a big unity. Because the proportion, Pythagoras proportion, has an origin in numeric uh, proportion. There's no fraction, but only commensurable number. And this commensurable no number has been proposed also during the Renaissance. And architecture becomes to be the mirror of purest ideas, the sounds of the celestial spheres, not human habits pure ideas, concept, purely conceptual. As I was saying, the Renaissance in Italy recovers the Platon Pythagorean ideas about harmony and the mathematical perspective is a paradigmatic example of it. Differently, the golden section, the Fibonacci series, is based on uncommensurable numbers uncommensurable numbers. And the Fibonacci series, the golden section is a fractal terms is in anywhere in everywhere in nature. Nature till the human body is completely viewed of Fibonacci series and, and golden section. And the human body perfectly embodies the golden section till the deepest part of the brain in the hippocampal in the interrhinal areas inside which the, the grid cells 
that our brain used to map space to calculate the distance because it has a mechanism that we implicitly use when we move inside the space can permit us to calculate the distances intuitively is a sort of a hexagonal grid that we project outward when we enter inside the space the ratio between the different layers composing the interrhinal cortex composing the space the mechanism of the space the, the area inside the, the brain in which we map the different scales the brain because we have a, a grid maybe based on one meter of, uh, of, of side the hexagonal is a one meter side another grid is, 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 a, is a smaller measure the same space with another grid based on half meter so the ratio between the first and the second and the third and the follow and the further then the further uh, level of the interrhinal cortex based on the a number it's really is really close to the Fibonacci series ratio 1.61 it's between 1.5 1.7 this is not occasional that our brain is naturally capable not capable is naturally seeking to find outdoor this kind of proportion in the space that is not based on conventional numbers but unconventional numbers and so it's now this kind of approach the, the the decision to overlap in any way in any way the purest ideas the purest conventional numbers has been overlapped to the human body by francesco di giorgio martini this kind of design which you perceive that there's no way no, no, no signals according which you can think uh, Giorgio Martini recognized the proportion, the golden section proportion inside the body of humans overlapping this kind of reading, geometrical reading to the body. It is not occasional this happened. So we are seeing since the inception of architecture, there has been an interplay since the beginning of architecture between the architecture intent as a human habits centered and a concept based product. There's always been a counter and fight between the two ways to conceive architecture. Architecture has translation of habits, of human habits, in a construction of architecture as a pure concept. A pure origin of architecture doesn't exist at all. Since the inception, we find a detachment between the experience, essence, the emotion elicited by the design. The power to synchronize, pay attention, because the power to synchronize hurts and belief uh, through emotions using architecture has always been too attractive, too attractive. Anyway, this is not attunement. But now we need to erase this divide because arche is a body sensation. There's no arche, but only human interpretation of the beginning. <clears throat> And so the architectures of the human institution that Luscan was looking for, which is the, the, right, the, real, the right shape of the hospital, which is the right shape, the proper shape of school, so on, can permit us to, to conclude how does human science support architecture? I think distinguishing habits, essences, and the, their bodily expectation from conceptual re representation. We need to start distinguishing the conceptual representation of pure ideas by habits of humans, essences of their experiences and their bodily expectation that we project outward in the space. And distinguishing narrow phenomenological essences of human experiences from a representation of an ego-centered intellectual concept or techno-driven metaphors, or the power for, for, for sale. We need to come back to the human sensation. And there are no arch arch archetypal forms of experiences, senses, but only bodily sensation or emotion. Concluding before it's too late. Neuroscience can support architects in giving models and methods for behaviors, measurements, Right, we can. We know very well that through neuroscience we can measure the 
biofeedback, we can understand if we are arousing, we are relaxing. It can give us insights into how we navigate the grid cells, the place cells. We can understand in many ways how can we navigate. We can understand how memory works, our memory, which is the, the, the function of the memory. How singularly we respond to the light, uh, we respond to the sound, we respond to materials, the geometries could be linear again, straight angles and so on. But in my view, the crucial is that uh, the knowledge of the physiological metamorphosis of body in action within the space in an evolutionary perspective. This is the, the, the crucial uh, understanding that we have to develop about the contribution of neuroscience to the architecture. Maybe also more important is the learning how to manage bodily memories or emotional expectation. Because uh, emotional expectations that we develop during experiences, learning, taking care, dwelling, uh, and so on, ex experiences, are bodily memories bodily memos connected to spatial patterns. So architects have a huge responsibility. Each design selecting the expectation and translating the physiological arche in form is a political action. It's a political action. Because we need to understand how can we select the proper expectation and how we can translate the human expectation in architectural forms. This is a political action because it is correlated the way through which we socialize. An architect can be habits friendly or a seductive machine, seductive machine. We are more prone to use architecture as a seductive machines. We want to be archistars. Oh, everybody wants to be archistar. All our students dream to begin an archistar. And we are using architecture as seductive machines. A seductive machine coupled to manipulate people, embedding its form with concepts and individual, individual ideas. Thanks to the human science, such as the neuroscience and environmental psychology architects can work more consciously. I think different, taking care of human better than ever. Thanks. So I think we can open to question if you, is there anybody who want to make some questions because uh, our professor uh, uh, made a very beautiful lesson what is architecture <laughs> what we do what we must do in the future uh, I don't know if you if you know some of the names of the persons uh, who worked uh, inside uh, uh, neurosciences, uh, neurobiologists. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, do you know um, uh, do you know the affordances uh, of James of Gibson? Do do you know it? Because there is a very, in, very important book of Gibson uh, in the 70 years of the 20th century that was the theory of affordances. Uh, and um, especially in 1977, the ecological approach to visual perception. It is a sort of a masterpiece uh, for the development, uh, the future development in uh, narrow sense uh, and um, affordances was uh, the mutual uh, um, the mutual interaction between an agent and the environment so uh, from this 
coupling between the agent and the environment, uh, it was possible to have from the environment uh, some opportunities for action. We move ourselves uh, in relationship with some opportunity or not that the environment can give us. So, um, for instance, uh, um, affordance is uh, a very important concept during uh, all the development uh, uh, for the relationship between uh, neuroscience and architecture. Um, so, I don't know, also, uh, L'errore di Cartesio, Discard Errors, is a very important book uh, by Antonio Damasio. It was a book uh, at uh, the second half of 19th, 20th century, and is very, very important uh, um, if you want to, uh, to deepen some, uh, some aspect uh, of, uh, of the lesson. Um, or uh, Malgrave, of course, uh, uh, Malgrave wrote uh, a book uh, about the relationship between uh, the, um, not the empathy of space in English is, uh, is another, the title of English, uh, uh, environment and architecture in Italy, embodiment and architecture. So, and also Varela for the neurophenomenology is another very important essay. It was written in 1996. And uh, neurophenomenology is uh, a new concept uh, for, uh, for the neuroscience and for the phenomenology, uh, for the philosophy, for the psychology also, psychology. Um, because uh, it uh, meets the first person that is from phenomenology and the third person that is from uh, cognitive science, uh, uh, that is uh, neuroscience. So if, if you want to deepen something, you, you can ask me or uh, maybe also <laughs> to Professor Ruzon, because there are many, many important books. And so if you have some question, no? Nobody? If there are no questions, I can start breaking this ice. Okay. And because I have a lot of questions after this presentation. So for what I could understand, this kind of research tries to make architectural decisions as much as objective as possible, uh, starting from data collected uh, of emotions and body movement and trying to translate this kind of data into space, into architectural project. And I was uh, curious to understand uh, because I, I was thinking for different cultures, the emotions are very different. Mm -hmm. For example, I was searching now uh, Red, the color red in Africa means in some states of Africa means dead or war, while in, in while in India means luck, in China happiness, in Europe passion, and also the color white in Western countries is purity, peace, and in China is used for funerals. Mm -hmm. So okay, we, how can do you we, deal? Can we correlate the Universal yes. and the cultural. Yes. The, the nature and the nurture. Yes. It is a, a very long uh, debate about nature and nurture. Um, so I used to think about, uh, about this topic uh, that we have to think about the, um, this kind of issue, making reference to the co-evolution first, because we are used to think about evolution in Darwinian terms, but the Starting from the last decades, uh, we started thinking about evolution in two another way, considering the culture as a, a co-evolutive dimension, but it really in genetic, uh, because the genetic outcome, the transformation of the genes through culture, 
has been possible because if you think about the Homo erectus started two million years ago, also the first the stones refined to produce a, 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 to a pool um, a weapon to cut the skin of the of the priest or the priest. Sorry, even this has been a cultural object, technological object, been conceived in this kind of vision as a cultural object, transforming. The control of the fire is, has been enormously important, transforming physically the, the body of humans. This kind of transformation has been embedded in the, in the, in the evolution. We cannot consider simply the, the gene as a, something that is detached by the cultural and the technological transformation. Also, the fire, for, for example, produced a, a shift of the circadian rhythms the circadian rhythm is the, the rhythm through which we regulate serotonin, melatonin release during the, the lights and during the night. Well, the control of fire postponed, transformed the circadian rhythm gra gradually. This is another topic. We transformed this kind of issue in 300,000 years. <laughs> and now we are asking to humans to transform the responses in a few years. It's a technological push is, is, is important to, to understand this way. But coming back to your question more uh, deeply, the colors, for example, um, and the light uh, are something that um, is one of the two example, simpler uh, example that can be can say to us uh, in which way we have to consider the, reg the regions inside which we are designing the light. The light of the northern countries and the light of the in South Africa is completely different. So the light is a, one of the key to read the, the transformation of bodily. When you are thinking to the description of the man walking up till the peak of the hill, and this kind of interaction produces a shift from the, the light, the reflected rays that we perceive when we are in the lower part of the, of the, of the path. In the lower part of the path, the reflected rays inside our retina are the majority. Walking up gradually till the peak of the hill, the, the percentage of direct rays coming from the sky is completely changed. So there's a transformation from reflected rays to direct rays. The intensity of the direct rays is enormously higher than the reflected rays and the colors. And the, the so this kind of shift is different in the northern than in the south, southern countries. So simply the light, the kind of light transforms this kind of interaction, but also the color consequently, because the material that you perceive in nature is completely different. And so you can, you start to perceive it in completely different ways, but the cultural dimension is something that we have to consider when we design. It's impossible avoiding, and there's no a natural, a simply, simply, natural key that we have to use to design because we have to insert also the cultural dimension inside the, the, the all the, the process the schedules and the the the, the so the, the 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 palette that we have to use if we want to use this kind of metaphor the palette to design i don't i know i don't know if i am able to answer to your question okay thanks. yes and i have a further question yeah i am here uh, because the, the, the fact that uh, triggered me was uh, because I was looking at uh, the website uh, of Tuned, I think is the name of the uh, really of this studio that uh, tries to make research in this in with this kind of uh, theory. And I, I was looking at an airport uh, project. Mm -hmm. And an airport, for example, is. But in that case, we are we have uh, we came along with uh, another team, Gnosis for Naples, uh, Di Martino, uh, Antonio Di Martino. Uh, we worked all together for ends. And our my charge, my my commitment was related to these the, the guidelines. Uh, to redesign the interiors of the airports. And we studied the, the, the airports uh, considering the, um, 
the experience of you, uh, experiences of users in, in micro phenomenological terms. So we analyze all the movement, all the flows of users, of different users inside the space, first of all. Because anyway, we start always from users. First thing we have to understand which kind of profiles we are working with. So we are using, uh, we are working with uh, travelers, we are working with business travelers, tourist travelers, what kind of ages, the staff, uh, which is the role of the staff, where the staff work. Um, so we have to analyze all the users and the flows of pets, the pets and flows of people inside the, the place. Splitting the giant area in smaller areas inside which you recognize specific expectation. Because when, for make an example, when users, travelers are approaching the, the desk for the check-in, they are living in that moment a very specific experience. They are waiting, they're expecting a kind of interaction, a particular kind of interaction with the person behind the, the desk. So the expectation, the emotional expectation is the key to shape the micro environment the micro perceptive field wrapping this particular experience. So you can recognize the same, the big space, big space, smaller units, small perceptive fields. You have to shape through the ceiling, through the, the walls, through the acoustic dimension, the colors. You have to shape these micro perceptive fields in, in order to respond and to couple, to couple with the expectation people are projecting outward in that moment. Bravo, okay. And are there then any uh, testing after the project is realized, is uh, built? Did, do you test if it works and then maybe you understand something not and frequently, you change? Not frequently as we, I, I'd like, uh, because now all the clients ask us to, uh, to test uh, the result, the outcomes of the project. But in the case, uh, for example, we designed a logistic platform for Prologis. Uh, Prologis is uh, the biggest player in the world, but logistic platforms, they are managing 180 billion uh, dollars of uh, logistic platforms all around the world. And they asked us to design a guidelines, general, general guidelines for the new, for the renewal of the platform, humanization of logistic platform. You know very well, I hope you know very well. <clears throat> that the logistic platform is one of the, the is a hill is a, for, for workers is a dramatic, uh, dramatic condition, dramatic uh, environment, um, particular for the, the, the cooperatives and for the, um, the foreigner workers that are working frequently inside the logistic platform. They asked us to make something capable to transform the logistic platform, we produce the guidelines. After the first application in Lodi that we propose a project, specific project to modify Somalia, a big, very big uh, logistic platform, uh, they asked us to measure. So we organized with the University La Cattolica Sacro Cuore di Milano, with Cinzia Di Dio and her, her team, we organized uh, the administration of some behavioral test. Not a physiological test because they were impossible in that condition to measure the to measure the the, the outcomes in in ecological terms which inside the environment directly. We organized a, a, a small room, so which uh, the collaborators of Cinzia proposed some uh, some tests, specific specific tests, a series of specific tests to measure socialization, prosocial behavior, emotional regulation capacity of coping, uh, all many, many factors, dimensions that are capable to understand. And we measure these factors before the intervention in 100 person and repeating the same experience, the same test after the intervention, immediately after and six months later, creating a, cre creating a curve of responses capable to depict the transformation of responses of users we are going to publish a paper in the, in the magazine, um, Good, this is the name of the magazine of the Genova University. We are going to publish a paper about this experiment with Cinzia Di Dio. 
um, before because they the client decide to insert mainly the East Street art inside the building because they cover many of the buildings with uh, great paintings and and so we started uh, to analyze how the paintings transform the perception of, of, of workers inside the so uh, workers there's two kind of works in the logistic platform because there's the staff uh, in the office the employees working inside the offices and, and the, all the remain larger the larger part of the of the person working inside the, the, the warehouses so we, we analyzed the, the re reaction in this case it's been able to analyze the reaction so we are pushing in this way we are trying to measure continuously because for us it's important to understand that we can improve the behavior of people the prosocial behavior the individual health of people reducing stress we can better control the health of people because stress is a chronic stress particularly it's very damage dangerous it created a lot of damages and disease the telemery inside the chromosome in cells shorten during the life of humans shortening the the, the telemery is the cover the cover of the of the <clears throat> the chromosome you reduce the life expectancies because it can create a very dead, dramatic uh, disease as cancer for example um is well recognized as a, as a universally scientifically recognized that the stress the chronic stress can produce this kind of outcome so i invite you all of you to take care of, <laughs> of yourself reducing stress as possible meditating relaxing if you can we have a question <laughs> thank you good afternoon thank you for the presentation and i had the opportunity to read about your work and i found some things related to the virtual reality and for instance um the adoption of the new technologies it can be said that it is possible to change the emotional perception um so how can these new sources change the architectural architectural experience and what factors should be taken into account when implementing any of this in our design or in our projects now, let me understand better your question because i'm um, like i'm not capable i'm capable to understand exactly what you are saying um, you are asking about virtual reality now yes uh, and the um, the virtual reality in our project mm -hmm. and the experience inside <laughs> of this <laughs> big question <laughs> how many hours do we have do we have <laughs> No, I want to. Allora, uh, virtual reality is there. Uh, yeah. Usefully, usefully we can embrace the virtual reality uh, <clears throat> to make experiment, make experiment, because we are using a virtual reality to make experiment in lab to test. We have developed an experiment, experimenting with the National Council of Research Department of Neuroscience in Parma using virtual reality to test the response of users, but designing. Uh, We have to pay attention to the digital world. Digital world is very useful, but at the same time can deprive, deprive you, the architect of a great experience, the experience to use the, the hands, to use the imagination. Imagination is a brain. This is not a, an hand, this is a brain. The, the, the hand thinks, Ioanni Palasma written a very important book, uh, The Thinking Hands. So because we, our hands are is, a, is, a, is an extension of our brain. It's a part of our brain. Our brain extended to all the body. So if you externalize, I used to this term in a very clear way. Externalize some action experience that you normally develop using your body and your brain, and you externalize to a tool. You are improving the power, the effectiveness of the process, apparently. You are shortening the time you spend to, to gain this the, the, the object, your services, the outcome, but you are losing a, a great opportunity for you to understand how the, the project works, I think. 
it is really important having this clear this idea. Okay, it's, it's later. I think it's later. If you have time. Yes, or... we have a time. Another a minute. Yeah, we thanks. Have one. Nice for the students. Thank you for your lecture. And uh, my question is about your topic of uh, virtual reality. And uh, my question is, uh, when presenting a project through virtual reality expectation are generated on the build project. So what are the biggest challenges to keep a project through to what was shown? I don't think that human expect. I don't think human expectation can modify themselves according the the tool. I think uh, we expect something uh, starting from our very very long 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 trajectory, evolut evolutive trajectory in our experience as human, in our biography. So virtual reality, sorry, if I understood correctly your question, I, I try to answer. Um, virtual reality is something that modify our interaction within the world. Because for example, you don't move the, your body. You are not moving your body. You are not, you are, as I was saying before, you are not, we are not trees. We, are, we have not roots. We have bodies moving inside the space. We interact and experience the space through all the sensorial system and mainly through the body because moving the body, we create a lot of information for the brain. If we don't move the body because you are stopped on the chair and you are looking through only your eyes, you can produce a simulation of the body because the, through the, the shape of the environment, you trigger some kind of simulation of bodily interaction. Anyway, it is true. But the experience to, to collect the data through the body is not trivial. Because if you collect data only through the eyes, through the retina, and creating simulation of bodily interaction because I don't have the time to explain in which way we, we, we can produce embodied simulation, so-called embodied simulation. But we figure out body movement. Three, think about this kind of uh, ceiling moving down. You are brought to move down. If you the ceiling move up, you are brought to open your chest. It is the very simple, simplest movement of the body. Compressing the compressing. Something that completely changed the mood of your, of your brain. Your chin, if you move up your chin, scientifically it's been demonstrated that you increase your mood positively, moving up your chin. If you move down your chin, you are implicitly creating a sensation of down. It is a scientific demonstrate. There's no doubt about this. So if, if you move, uh, create condition to move slightly up or slightly down, you change, you are changing the mood of, of the space you are designing. So if you are stopped in front of the screen, there's no way to move up and down your chin. There's no way to, to transform your body. There's, you are cutting dramatically the, the information your brain is receiving through the experience, because this is a, not a true experience, it's a virtual experience. It's called virtual reality, it's virtual experience. I think we have no time now to conclude. I'm sorry, but we have to uh, conclude because you have to start a new lesson, I think, in the afternoon. Thanks a lot uh, for the, the, the time you have spent. Thanks a lot to you. Really. Thank you, Professor Ruzzan. Thank you to uh, our professor, Paola Gregory, who moderated this meeting. And thank you all for participating. See you next week.